is Ignacio Ruiz. In this video, we are going to discuss the fundamentals of approximation theory and of the Chebyshev framework. Now, this is uh, in this uh, session, we are going to set the ground for all other subsequent videos uh, about uh, of how to use this approximation theory and Chebyshev framework in the context of risk calculations. So there are quite a few things quite important that we need to discuss in this in this first session. And as a result, I've decided to split it into two videos, part one and part two, to make it easier for you to watch. And this is part one. All right. So let's get into the into the cracks of the problem. We have seen in previous videos that we can uh, we can uh, simplify the the structure of a risk calculation engine in a number of steps, and the one in which uh, the calculation gets has a bottleneck from the computational point of view is the pricing or the sensitivity calculation step. I usually call it generically as the pricing step. Now, the brute force ways of solving this is we are going to have to call the, origi the an original pricer, uh, typically a front office pricer, lots of times. For example, in the context of CVA or IMM, we're talking about easily half a million or one million times. So an alternative to this consists in going through a fast approach by which we're going to create an approximating object this approximating object is first calibrated or built in a first step by calling the original pricer a limited number of times. And then once we get the approximating object, uh, in the second step, we call it, uh, for example, one million times for the risk calculation engine. So let's focus in this fast approach. What are the properties that we want it to have, that we need it to have, really? First of all, it, step number one is to be super fast convergent. That is that we need to be able to create an approximating object that is a very good replica of the original pricer so that the error is very small but calling the original pricer very few times. Otherwise, the exercise doesn't make sense. So it needs to be a technique that, from the mathematical point of view, converges to the original function, to the original pricer, very fast. For example, ideally exponential. You know, in practice and reality, we cannot hope for better than exponential. Now, the second one is it needs to be the, the, the object that we create has to be super fast to evaluate. Why? Because otherwise it defeats the purpose of the exercise. Third, it needs to be very stable to evaluate. We are going to see in, in future videos, in fact, that sometimes you can have things that are seem to be fast and easy to evaluate, but then when you implement it in a computer, it, you can have numerical instability. So we need to make sure that we don't have any of those. Now, as a fourth one, as a fourth property that we wanted to have is that we need to have a good control on the error. This is quite important uh, because in implementation, we want to make sure that before the whole calculation finishes, we want to know what error we're going to get. So we're going to have a sense of, of the approximation that we're using. On, and on that way, we can calibrate it on step one accordingly. Or even in the worst case scenario, we can reroute the, the calculation through other alternative uh, uh, alternative routes that we can create in, in the code to make sure that uh, that we get to a, to a reasonable result. But we want to see this before we get to the end of the calculation. So we want to have some control of the error in the, in, in the uh, let's say, on the fly. And fifth, something that is uh, very, very also important in practice is that the whole framework has to be, or ideally, you want it to be mathematically proven. In fact, I've spoken to a number of uh, money validation or regulators about this type of approaches. And when they see some uh, that, the, the, that the solution it is mathematically solid and robust, they feel much more comfortable. So it is something that, that is also quite, quite, uh, something quite important that we want to have. Now, in this session, we are going to focus especially in step number one, super fast convergence. That is going to set the ground for anything else afterwards. So let's focus in, 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 in that. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about different approximation frameworks that we can have. So let's suppose, let me get this here. Let's suppose that we have a function, x, f, OK, something like that. And we want to approximate it between two points, a and b. OK, OK. What is the what is the first thing that we can do? Well, the obvious thing is we and, and let's suppose that we want to use 
to make the plot easy, four points, right? So we have to distribute the, the four points here, and we know nothing in principle about the function. We don't know what this black line is. So what do we do? We know nothing about the function. We pick equidistant points. So obviously the two extremes, and then few points here, so that they are equidistant, right? And then we call the function in these points here. We obtain these values. And then when we have these values, we can think of doing, for example, some linear interpolation, right? Or we can think of doing some sort of uh, of spline interpolation, it's quite popular as well, something like this. All right. Also, something that we can think about is um, it is uh, it is uh, doing a uh, fitting a polynomial because we know that when we have in this case four points. There is one unique polynomial of degree three that goes through those four points. And in general, when we have n plus one points, there is a unique polynomial of degree n that goes through those n plus, uh, n plus one points. So we can uh, get, uh, we can basically calculate it as well, which is going to be something different to the other, to the other two. All right, so that's another approach. Another approach would be, for example, the popular regressions. In the regression techniques, what we're going to do is we're going to regress cash flows from the future for the derivative from the different scenarios of the risk engine and then we're going to get like a cloud of of points of possible cash flows and here we're going to do is we're going to fit a, a polynomial or a number of polynomials to it right now and then uh, another approach that they that can be used is something like a machine learning type of type of techniques that are starting to to be out there in fact uh, uh, I had a, a, a talk, very interesting talk uh, last year about it. Having said that, it is very interesting, but so far the results are, there is nothing, personally I haven't seen anything convincing from the practical point of view. Anyway, so we have this type of approaches. So let's, let's see now, yeah. Let's see now, we're gonna introduce now the Chebyshev framework into, into this like another approach, and we're gonna see how really and we're going to demonstrate to you mathematically and, and in a very solid way how the charity framework is better than any other thing that we can think of at least that, that i know of and, and i think that exists in the in the industry now everything that i'm going to say or well not everything most of the things that i'm going to say are based on this book if you want to get deep into this uh, into this uh, into this uh, problem or approximation theory i strongly recommend this book Approximation Theory and Approximation Practice by Professor Trefethen from Oxford University. I met him uh, a couple of years ago. He's a super nice guy. And, uh, and I strongly recommend that if you really want to get into, into this uh, subject, uh, start with that book. It's, it's an amazing book. It's really, really good. So let's go now into, into the let's 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 transition into the problem that we want to tackle it with more detail and then the, the the solution that we that we are going to suggest that we're going to discuss polynomial interpolation polynomial interpolations have a pretty bad reputation now you can find the literature the following uh, uh, sentences that you can see in the screen in fact i've taken this uh, this uh, these phrases from trevethan's book for example, you can find that polynomial interpolants really converge to a general continuous function. Polynomial interpolation is a bad idea. Also, in the very nature, polynomials of a very high degree do not constitute reasonable models for a real life phenomena. Now, these type of things are, as, we are, as I'm going to demonstrate to you in this session, are untrue and have misled us for, for many years. In, in fact, when we were studying university, uh, 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 there's been a, it's, it's basically, uh, most of us have been misled by these type of things. So, now these ideas, in fact, have been encouraged by the following results. If we think, let's think of the Ronke function, which you can see in the screen. This Ronke function, it is uh, super smooth, is analytical, I mean, it cannot be smoother. And in spite of that, the approximate, if you try to approximate this Ranke function with a gristled point, with a polynomial, it diverges. Let's have a look at this. I have here a, a little code. Let's go to my Linux uh, environment, in which I have a, whoop, 
in which I have a, a little script that I've written in Python. And for example, let's start. Get my glasses on. We have the run head function that we define up here. Well, we just call it another another function outside of this script, but the the the, the run head function is, is defined here. And then let's let's uh, try to interpolate it between the points minus one and one, right? And let's start with ten points. Okay, so let's run this. And what you can see in the screen now is two graphs. One of them, the green graph that you can see here is the actual function. And the blue one is the polynomial with, in this case, uh, 10 points. So the nine, the polynomial of degree nine that goes through through equidistant points. And here at the bottom of be, be underneath the graph, you can see the maximum error of the approximation. Right. Now, so we start with 10 points and we say, okay, this is what we get. Now let's go, for example, to 12 points and let's run it again. Ah, you can see that it gets better, it gets worse, right? The the error is bigger, and you can see um, you can see it in the graph, and so you can see the number that I that I'm plotting that that I'm showing that. Now let's get instead of uh, 12, 14 points. Again, it's getting worse. Let's get 16 points. It keeps on getting worse. 20. It's getting worse and worse. Let's go to 25. It's getting even worse. I mean, this is quite a kind of intuitive because what we are doing here is we're saying that we are giving more information to the approximator, and in spite of that, the error is getting bigger. So this is this is this is quite a, a challenge, as you can see. Let me go back to the to the slides. Where, where am I? Here now. So this is quite an, uh, quite a quite a quite a um, quite a challenge, and of course, this type of results made people think, well, trying to interpolate something with polynomials is a waste of time because a, a, a function that is as simple and as smooth and analytical, this function is analytical, as this one, it diverges. So the, the interpolation diverges. So let's not waste the time anymore with this. And in fact, this was even more encouraged by the result by Faber in 1914, which he showed that for the class of continuous functions, there is no polynomial interpolation scheme that will ensure convergence. So, you know, quite frankly, if you are told these things, you say, okay, let's forget about polynomials for approximation. They are a waste of time. That's what I would think in the face of this. All right. Fortunately, when we think along these lines, we have missed something and we have missed something. And I'm going to, that, this is what I want to show to you in this, this session, what we have missed, what we have missed, and how to, how to fix this. So what happens is that as soon as we restrict ourselves to Lipschitz continuous function, and just as a reminder, a Lipschitz continuous Lipschitz continuity is a, is just a very weak condition of continuity. So basically, all real, or most, the large majority of real life functions are Lipschitz continuous. As soon as we restrict ourselves to Lipschitz continuous, we have guaranteed convergence. That's 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 good. On top of it. If we restrict ourselves to analytical functions, we not only have guaranteed convergence, but if we if we choose the right interpolation framework, we know we can demonstrate that it is going to be exponentially convergent. This is great. This means that we have a framework that we can that if the function is analytical, we can approximate the function exponentially. And what that means in practice is that with very few points, we can nail the function. With a very high accuracy. Now, the derivative prices are actually analytical functions, and 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 of course they are because we use Greeks all the time to measure risk, right? And if you remember, an analytical price, an analytical function is is one of the definitions. It's a function whose Taylor expansion converges in every point. So when we use Greeks, which is the first or the second derivative, what we're saying is that implicitly we're saying that the price is an analytical function. So in the very, very worst case, a pricer is analytical, piecewise analytical by in, in, in different by blocks. Right? So given that we have this framework, pricers are analytical or in the worst case piecewise analytical functions, and we have a framework that we're gonna see that is exponential convergent, let's use it. So and this framework is the Chebyshev framework. Let's get some intuition into how it works. 
as I ha as I, we have seen here, if we have a function and we know nothing about the function, what is the my best guess as to if I want to approximate it with a number of points n, what is my best guess for where to put those points? Well, the first thing to do is put them equidistant, right? That's the, what makes more sense. If we know something about the function, you can say, okay, what we can do is we can concentrate them around the curvatures, or what, about, what I mean by this is where the curvature is strong, or do these type of things. Okay, that makes sense. However, what happens if we extend the function in the complex plane, and then we get equidistant points in the unitary circle, as you can see in the, in the screen, and then we project them to the real line, as you can see in the screen, and then so that we get to the red dots that you see in the, in the, in the plot in the screen. Those dots, the red dots, are the Chebyshev points, the so-called Chebyshev points. And it so happens that when we interpolate in the correct way using that and using the Chebyshev spectral decomposition framework, we are going to achieve exponential convergence. Let me show it to you with the, the function that we were discussing before, the Runke function. Let me go again to the Python. And now I have this, let me get it, my glasses, so I know what I'm seeing. Let's, this variable here, percentage in the code, controls these points here. When this value is zero, I'm getting equidistant points. When this value is one, I'm getting, we are getting Chebyshev points. And the percentage, what does is, is it moves them. So if, for example, for four points, the Chebyshev points tend to, let me get the, this color, for example, Chebyshev points are going to be uh, this one, this one, and then don't forget that given that they are the projection of of equidistant points in the unitary circle in the complex plane, they tend to concentrate in the extremes. So the first four temperature points are going to be this, this two, and then this, and this approximately, right? So this percentage variable in the code, what it's going to do is going to move this point from here to here, and from here to there, okay? So let's see what happens when we move it. We start at zero, which is what we had before. Now let's put it at 0 0.2. Let's run this. Okay, it's getting better. Have a look at the arrow. In the graph, it's more difficult to see, but we're going from uh, 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 1 in error. Ooh, interesting. Now, we'll, let's get to 40% closer. Now, we is getting even better. The error is going to go to for the, of the, the order of magnitude of 10 to the order of magnitude of 10 to 0. Or the, to the, the 3.8 in this case. And you can see in the graph, it's getting better. Now, let's get it to 60%. Ooh, it's, it disappeared in the error. You can see it in the graph. You don't even need a number anymore. Now, let's get to 80%. Is this, in the graph, it disappears. And now we have an error of 10 to the minus 2, whereas in the one before, it was 10 to the minus 1. Let's get to the Chebyshev points, one. Look, we have an approximation error, maximum error of 10 to the minus three. The graph looks absolutely perfect. So you can see with this example that by doing this, let me go back to the presentation, that by doing, by moving the points from the equidistant points to the Chebyshev points, using the same, the same framework, which is an interpolant, we are reducing the error massively. Okay. In fact, I was the other day. I was in a, a few months ago. I was in a in a forum, one of these for online forums about uh, mathematics and and codes and and practicing of derivatives and these type of things. And they were talking about the Chebyshev points as the magic points because they they seem to be magic. They seems to be like when you go to when you use the Chebyshev points to call your function and and then you use that information in the correct way. It is, you can approach the function in an amazing way. In fact, as we're going to see soon, exponential. And that creates, that unleashes a number of, 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 of uh, properties that are really practical in the real life calculations. And of course, there's no magic about them. There is a theory behind it that we're going to see in the next, uh, in the next video. And uh, so I'm going to stop here. This is the end of part one.
And what I invite you is that if you go to the next uh, to the part two of this session in the video, the next video, and we're going to see the theory on the maths and why these Chebyshev points behave in what seems to be like a magical way. Thank you.